with ADHD, we need consistency. Does that make sense to be inconsistent yeah. for kids that need consistency? And the whole thing of behavior management is you can't help your child and follow through at home if you don't know what's going on every day and you can't be consistent. That's not what are you teaching them? Today, we're going to get into more of supporting and communicating with the teacher. And so what you want to do is lay the groundwork. You've been in school about three weeks now. So lots of different things have been happening. Um, they're still working on, you know, the social emotional development right now, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but you want to lay the groundwork and you want to, you know, want to let the teacher know right up front. And that's why that paper is really helpful. Um, that you, you know, you're going to be one of these parents that you are going to be involved and it's just sets it up. The expectation is right there. You're not going to be the parent that just, you might talk to them twice or three times a year, maybe see them back to school or whatever that, you know, you have this expectation that you're going to work together and you're putting the, you're laying the groundwork and you're putting it out there and you can talk to the teacher and say, you know, what is your preference? Let them know that you respect them. Do you like email? Do you like phone? Do you like text? You know, how can we work this out together? Because there's going to be a lot of times where we're going to need to speak because things are happening. You're not there in the classroom. You're, you're going to need to communicate. And, and how do you prefer? Or do you like email, phone, or text, or whatever it is? And see between the two of you if you can agree on one or what the best option is. What are the times of the day that you can communicate? You know, if you're working and depending on the type of job you have, you might not be able to text somebody back right away or call back, or you may be able to. So share with them the logistics of that. And um, you want to just firm this up and agree on that and um, give them time to respond. I also want to say that they have a lot going on. You know, they have other commitments at school that they're, they have to follow through on with the administrators. They have lesson plans, they, and I'll get into a little bit more about what, again, what they're facing this year and what their mindset is a little bit more. I'll expand on that. So you need, you need to give them a reasonable amount of response time, um, unless it's an emergency. And, a lot, and that's important because when we're upset and we want something, you know, that we think happened or didn't happen, and that gives you that time to cool down, too, because sometimes, you know, you do really have to get composure of yourself before you speak to somebody not in all situations but in some you know it does happen so um and let them know you know what your response time is and you'll do your best to get back as well so that's just firming it up laying the groundwork of how you're going to communicate which is letting the teacher know that yeah this is a team approach okay this i i wanted to bring up and you probably never heard about this so just added this in here when you communication when you communicate if there's always a 738-55 rule that most people aren't aware of. Only, and, and this is like from my work with non people that have nonverbal learning disorders, that only 7% of communication is the words that you speak. 7%, that's not a lot. 38% is your voice, your tone of voice, your speed, your rate of speech, okay? And 55% is your body language. So as you see here, when you're communicating with the teacher, it's important that you're aware that, you know, the majority of what you are communicating is through your body language, your facial expressions, your gestures, your tone of voice, your rate of speech. Only 7% is what you say. So that's really important for you to know, because have you ever been, you know, with, you know, you're with somebody, anybody in your family, you're saying to them, they're saying you're mad and you're like, I'm not mad. But you know you're mad because your tone of voice is saying it. So you need to really just be aware of how you are communicating with the teacher. You can Google this, but just be aware that, you know, you have open body language, your arms are open, that your tone of the speech is appropriate um, to what, you know, it's not condescending, it's not angry, it's, you know, that you are communicating that your body language matches with what you're saying verbally. So your body language is, is highlighting on that, that it matches. There's not a mismatch because, you know, you can kind of tell when somebody's lying, their body language just gives them away. So, you know, if you want to practice this with somebody or look in the mirror, um, I don't want to discount how important this is because this is how you're going to be communicating. And 
It's going to be all through verbal and nonverbal. When you're not doing emails or text or, you know, these are the times that you're, you know, either going to be online or with in person with the teacher, um, which is which is optimal because, you know, text and emails, you know, they don't convey any of this. So um, but that's going to be the majority how you're doing it. But you want to be really mindful that you have you've made this good impression with the teacher and hopefully they feel the same way um, that you can have good communication. Um, so they have a lot on their mind right now. Um, again, it's social emotional learning. Uh, maybe it's different in some of your schools, but by and large, this is the way that it is where they're not getting to academics maybe until November after they build up a community of learners, what it's like to be back in the building, how it is to work together, establishing routines and structures and how to emotionally regulate and manage the emotional regulation and meet everybody's needs in the classroom. We've got the learning loss and the assessments, which is what we're really going to focus on this week. Um, and so teachers are nervous. They're held accountable because they're graded on um, their, how are they meeting state standards and goals and their IEPs? I mean, that's what they're marked on. They get graded too. So they're nervous because they're, th they're walking around and they're thinking about all this and they've got adjustments to make at home, just like you do with COVID of going back to working and managing everything. Um, and, you know, I just want to point out to you that these teachers, you know, according to the um, American Teaching Federation and the National Education Association, that one in four are leaving from the stress of COVID by the end of 2021. Um, these teachers were working basically around the clock. They were not prepared. It was triage. You know, they may very well, I know as a former classroom teacher, you want to go into this and change the world, but you can't. And you, you realize that after so many years. And so they really want to be there and they want to do the best that they can. And sometimes their their hands are tied by administrators. They have a whole classroom of kids. They have to meet all the needs of all the kids. And sometimes a lot of teachers teach to the middle because that's the majority of the classroom. And they're trying to reach all the kids. And it is difficult. They're not always given the resources that they need. Um, and it's and it's tough to get through the day. I'm thinking that is there something that could be done for the teachers so they know that they're appreciated, that they've been through a lot? Can you get together with some of the other parents? Can you have a little party? A lot of teachers are having parties for kids coming back, realizing how hard it was. Can you do something for the teacher? Can the classroom, can the parents get together? Can the parents talk to the principal and, and just do like a luncheon or something for the teachers, little gift bags, whatever. They've been through a lot too. And just to kind of reignite this school year with goodwill and everybody, you know, doing the best that they can. And that would go a long way with empathy and letting them know what you feel like what it's to be in their shoes. So I think that would be a good thing to do if you can do that. And I don't know if you can, even if your kid can make a card, something as little as that. Um, and older kids can do something on the computer, regardless of how old your child is. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what I know a lot of you want to hear about is the learning loss and the gaps and how your child learns. I have here a fly because you had a great opportunity, as horrific as COVID is, is that you were a fly on the wall. And this is a big eye opener for many parents. You saw exactly what was happening. You saw your kid either thriving or surviving or crumbling or not being able to learn online. You saw everything how, and as things settled down a little bit, how did you saw how your kid learns best? You saw what they responded to, what they didn't respond to. You saw, were they able to master? I mean, yes, there was a lot of stress and a lot of kids didn't want to work. They couldn't work. Um, nobody really knew what they were doing, but eventually it got a little bit better. You know what worked, what didn't work. You know where they are. Do they know all their multiplication facts or do they not? Okay. You have this whole perspective. You are a vital part of this year. You, your voice has to be heard. Okay, you know what skills they mastered. You know what skills they didn't master. You know what's weak. You know what strategies work and don't work. What I want you to do is to get out this year's IEP and go over the prior year's IEP and compare them. What, what, what were they supposed to learn? last year. Look at that IEP. What? Go through it, copy it, print it out, write all over it, mark it up, 
Did they learn this? Did they learn that? Go through everything with a fine tooth comb, everything. Then get out this year's IEP and go through that and compare the two IEPs and find out where the gaps are. You know more than the teacher. The teacher doesn't know. They don't really have last year's teacher to talk to. It was, it was, uh, the year was just a mess. Um, some of these kids, you know, are getting assessed now. Some of them are not because they're learning how to learn in a community again. You need to get a meeting with the teacher. It might be too soon now. You know, I don't know. It just depends where you are. A lot of somebody said last week their kids really weren't doing anything yet. You know, who knows? Maybe they're just doing like a lot of group learning, reteaching social skills. How do you learn within a group? How do you make friends? A lot of kids forgot a lot of skills because they, it, you know, a year and a half, they lost a lot. And so they have to reacculate. I think of like, you know, a spaceship coming back in to earth, re-entry. And so it depends where your school is in that process and your child's classroom. But these IEPs have to be gone over. You're gonna have to make an appointment with the teacher at some point after the teacher has their assessment, or maybe you can do it now if the teacher is open. Then eventually you need to have a child study team meeting again. And the teacher needs to be there with her assessment results. You need to rewrite the IEP. I don't, you know, this is what I'm recommending. Um, this is what I want if it were my child. Because there's been a lot of learning loss and you just don't know where the child stands. You have no idea. You have a better, you, like I said, are the one that knows. So an IEP, is truly when the school and um, parents work together because you have to sign that IEP. So I don't know if you can get an addendum to it or rewrite it. You may not have to rewrite it, but um, like I said, you were a fly on the wall, you know, and so believe in yourself and have the confidence and don't be intimidated is also what I wanna say. Um, given that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, right now confusion because the kids got the short end of the stick last year. Schools weren't able to file the IEPs. They, some of the kids needed to learn in person. They were not getting their speech. They were not getting their occupational therapy. They were not able to meet the IEPs at all because we were in a crisis. Um, so there are some school, some school districts and some parents you know, that are filing lawsuits and they want the time to be made up. They want the speech time to be made up. They want the service time to be made up. And yes, it was an act of God, if you will, but and um, but the kids did lose out and these services, in my opinion, do need to be made up, the ones that they weren't getting. Um, because especially if your child has speech two, three times a week, you know, what were they really getting out of it? Did they miss occupational or physical therapy? Um, and, and so, unfortunately, you know, hopefully you don't have to sue, but there, there, this is going on right now, and it's yet to be seen or remains to be seen what's going to happen. How are these services going to be made up to these kids? Because um, if your kid wasn't one of the ones that thrived, because as we said last week, a lot of kids thrive. They didn't have to meet all the neurotypical standards. They could, um, you know, have less distractions at home. They could kind of do things on their own schedule. Some of the kids with ADHD really thrived and other ones really regress. And, and, and especially those kids who needed classroom aids and they weren't there to help them. And the parents were under crisis. So um, I don't know, you know where you are, but the IEP does not need to be a shot in the dark. It needs to be, it needs to be very clear. And right now I don't feel the IEPs are very clear. So they need to be tightened up. Another way you can assist the teachers is like given everything that we've just gone through and all this stress um, is they really do need your help. And most of them are very happy to have your help. What are the resources that you can provide for the teacher? Are you good with technology? Can you help them out with technology in the classroom? Um, usually schools have their own technology department, but there might be something that you could do for them that would really help the teacher out in the classroom. Um, can you help um, do other things that they need with your with your time and your talents? Or perhaps your kids have some talents that they could help out. The reason I'm getting at this is because you have the learning loss, and on top of that, you have kids with ADHD that do not engage 
unless they are highly interested. We know that the dopamine in the brain causes one to focus. And we know when they hyper-focus, when there's something that they're interested in, it's really hard to pull them away from it. If we could use that to our advantage, a lot of teachers, like I said, they don't have the time even to do this, even when it's not like after COVID. Can you go to the library? Can you, if they're learning about, you know, whatever the content area is, something in science, can you get books out of your own library and send them into school to, as, and, and have them available in the classroom so that kids can look at them during the day or when their work's done or whatever? That will make it more interesting. Can you help out with supplies? A lot of teachers I know years ago, I mean, I almost spent like 3000 a year, and that was years ago when the schools were paying for more. Um, can you help out with supplies? What exactly do they need? Um, can you get, think about when you go to a museum and why are museums interesting? Because they have, hand, they have a lot of displays. They're very visual. You know, they have artifacts. They have, um, if they're, you know, outfits that somebody that they wore in the Revolutionary War or whatever, they have artifacts, they have hands-on things, they have things to see. Sometimes you push buttons and, and then we'll talk about it and tell you what the display is all about. Can you bring that kind of stuff? I mean, a teacher would love that. I mean, can you get like a big box and, you know, just find some artifacts or something hands-on? Sometimes you can even order this stuff cheap, like um, places online and that would use a VAKT approach because we know that kids with learning disabilities, kids with ADHD are highly engaged. But the more visual it is, the more auditory it is, the more kinesthetic it is. Kinesthetic is body movement. When they're moving around, they learn better. And the more tactile it is when they're touching things, building things, models, you know, working hands-on um, and a lot of highly visual, interesting things and auditory as well. If you can just do that and send in a box with all kinds of stuff, whatever they're learning about, that helps, that that could take the teacher hours to do. And, and remember, they're working all day. And many, you know, good teachers don't just go home at three o'clock. They're after school till five. They're working into the night. That's what they do. This would really, really, help. they would love you. You would be forming a relationship with the teacher that would go so far, not only helping your child, but in helping a community of learners. And then you would get to form a relationship with the teacher based on something positive not just based on my kid isn't doing this, is misbehaving, is, this is happening, this is not happening, that it's, that it's um, relevant to what's going on. And so this would take your time. Okay, so then we know we talked about communication. You know, we, you can say a, a little bit in a lot of words, but you know, words don't mean much. It comes down to actions. When you show, when you're doing these things, you're showing that you want to be a partner in learning. Um, so these are the things that you can do. And this one says facilities, because I don't know if you can arrange something where the kids can go visit somewhere, a location on site, that would help the teacher out. So the daily reports are really important because they're a part of communication. They're tying home and school together. You have to know what's going on. You're not there, okay? This is gonna cut down on the need for phone calls and a lot of emails. This is gonna, instead of putting a fire out, you're preventing the fire. Because we know from research that from the National Institute of Mental Health, there's a landmark study that, you know, a lot of your kids are on medication and some are not. But the best approach is medication and behavioral therapy, management, whatever you want to call it, interventions. So we know that that's going to be the best outcome. A pill is not a skill. Okay. It helps. But you still need to work on things and, you know, learn how to manage yourself, executive functioning difficulties, all kinds of issues with ADHD, behavioral impulse control that affects social skills, as you know, and academics. So this is really crucial that you have some kind of daily report. You can set up a time with the teacher to meet the teacher. They, they know your kids a little bit by now. And there's many ways that this can be done. I mean, I don't, we're not gonna do a whole presentation because there's so much to say about this that we could just do one on setting this up. But it's tailored to your child. It's a communication between home and school and you get it every day. So you know what happened. It's geared towards your child. You pick the goals that affect your child. Um, it's tying together home and school. What happens at school follows through at home. Everybody's on the same page. So if something happened at school that was great, 
then you could, you know, get this report at home and you could reward your kid with extra um, computer time or whatever. A lot of everything today, the rewards tend to be around electricity, anything that works off of electricity, extra TV time, computer time, games, video games, um, iTunes, whatever it is. Uh, and of course, there's other things that don't cost money, things like, you know, having a friend over, going to somewhere to a movie with a friend, those kinds of social rewards. There's a whole, there's many different kinds of rewards you can do, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. So this would be tailored. It would it be an electronic form. Maybe your teacher has something. Would it be on a piece of paper? It would be for kids that switch classes or whether they don't, it would be by the time of the day, 9 to 9.45 or 10 to 10.45. Eat the day lined up, the whole schedule. And what did, how did your child do during that period of time? What were the behavioral goals? Maybe your child was really good at listening and they usually have a hard time interrupting. That day they did really great during that period of time. It could be something like for younger kids, like a smiley face sticker to be simplistic. It could be based on points that each period they get so many points and then when you they get home, it follows through at home and they get rewarded and they earn things at home based on these points or they lose things on home. It's, it's you know, rewards and consequences, behavior modification. Um, and then you can apply that. So, and you're also gonna have your own schedule for when they get home from school as well. But this is the, the, the homeschool connection and how you're going to, you know, reinforce what's going on at school to support the teacher and your child. The other thing I want to say is that it's really important and a lot of people don't do this because a lot of doctors, for some reason, I guess they're busy. You need to have, if you're on medication, you need to know if that medication is working in school. So what I typically do is have a rating scale, and you can ask your doctor for a rating scale, or you could get a copies of the Connors rating scale, or and you could do this, say, periodically to titrate the medication. Um, through you put the teacher's name, the time of the class, if they're switching classes, if it's a different teacher, and let's say for a week they're going to be rated Monday through Friday from you know one to two o'clock during this class of science or whatever. And every day of the week, it's not going to be a lot for the teacher. They're just going to go through and do the checkoff. Okay. Um, distracted by details, whatever the, whatever the rating scale says, able to maintain on task, um, waiting their turn to speak. And they're just going to rate the kid. Okay. Every day for a week. And then you're going to look at that. And then you're going to take that to your doctor and say, well, look, and you're going to look for the patterns and you're going to say, this is what ha is happening during this time of the day. That's going to help with the medication titration. And you can do that, you know, with younger kids too. It's usually one teacher that's with them for most of the day, except for lunch and whatnot and things like, and specials. But I think that's really important because that helps the teacher out so that the child could be at focusing at optimum and it helps your child out so that they can be do, doing their best but it's not done enough is what i'm saying so this is i think part of the communication and working together with the teacher um we recognize that teachers are very busy as you mentioned earlier yeah is that something that can be required through an iep or a section 504 plan or maybe a behavior intervention plan uh, to require teachers to complete these uh, forms each day so that the, the, the parent knows. I, you know, hopefully that a good teacher would just do that. I, I mean, if you have to go that far, then I guess you're going to have to go that far and, and put that in an IEP. You can add anything you want to an IEP. You just have to get everybody to agree on it. Right. And, you know, ideally it would just be that the teacher would want to do it, but unfortunately that's not the reality. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, the feedback. You from need that report. You, you, you do need it. Yeah, the feedback from some of the parents are that um, some teachers are resistant to it. So well, I understand they're resistant to it, but you know, do what you have to do because how are you going to help your child if you don't know what's going on? They're not going to call you every day on the phone or email you or you have you have to have some basis so that you can make you know 
follow through at home. Right. Um, do you have any advice on maybe uh, the fact that um, when children are in middle school, they may have many different teachers and they're, yeah. and they're communicating in many different ways? Is there a do you have any recommendations on like a streamlined approach that you that's can hard? Yeah, that's why I would ask the teacher, you know, on those cases, you know, you, to have a paper go from room to room, that's kind of hard. So you're probably going to have to use some kind of app or something. It gets harder when they get older because they expect your child to be more independent. And, um, you know, and sometimes they don't even want to help your child, like, you know, remember, let's put this in the book bag, book bag. Or, you know, did you write down your homework? Because I always say you can't just expect a kid to do that. Well, we want your child to be independent. But you have to teach them how to be independent. You know, you don't go from A to Z. You just have to you have to chunk it down and like give them the steps to do. So that's that's kind of a challenge because a lot of teachers that age that they don't they don't really want to do like you said they're resistant um, and they don't usually it's by email or something like that. I would try to find there's a lot of different apps out there that um, the teacher can use if they're open to it. There are apps where they can communicate in a quicker way, um, but that's that's tough with the with the communication writing it down and sending it home on paper the communication report is in my kids iep for bi-weekly but they only do it one to two times and then stop this has been like this for three years in a row i hate having it on the iep because they agree to bi-weekly or monthly but never follow through and they're in third grade now yeah and that's third grade so um so they do the they do the communication report, but they're that's no good. It's in, that defeats the whole purpose. It's supposed to be done every day. They do it inconsistently, and in third grade, that's not that hard to do. So I would definitely get a, I would definitely get a meeting. And same for the person that has the older the older kids. I would get a meeting, and if it's in the IP or get it, and they're going to have to come up with a way to communicate and make them do it. Yeah, going to have to hold them accountable in the yeah. IEP. Yep, that's what you have a leg to stand on. Yeah, that their their reasoning is is that um it's it's hard it's too hard to do it every week I guess. So at that age, that's really not that hard. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and it's consistent. It has to be. I mean, with ADHD, we need consistency. Does that make sense to be yeah. consistent for kids that needs consistency? And the whole thing of behavior management is. You can't help your child and follow through at home if you don't know what's going on every day and you can't be consistent. That's not what are you teaching them? Some days count and some days don't count. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that I would I would think that, you know, just keep doing your thing and being positive, but definitely hold them accountable. I yeah. mean, some, I know. Do you can you get like a parent advocate? Um, some states have them that they're for free. Yeah, that's I think you could bring in a parent advocate to kind of even with for older kids to kind of come in and, you know, do that for you and sit with you because it is intimidating when you're at a child study team meeting and you have all these professionals and it's just you. Yeah, you don't ever want to go in there alone. You bring somebody with you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative and very helpful. And thanks for answering everybody's questions.